The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented transcribed as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representatives in your community. Did you ever say to yourself, gee, I wish I could make more money, then I could do what I want to do? Well, I have news for you. In a recent survey covering people earning anywhere from $3,000 to $50,000 a year, 90% said that if they made more money, they'd be happier. That means that the problem is not how much you earn, but how to manage what you have. Now, there is one man who can help you, your local representative of the Equitable Society. He can show you how to build future security for your wife and children, how to make sure your children get a good education, or how to own your own home years ahead of time. In about 14 minutes, I want to tell you more about your local Equitable Life Assurance Society representative. Tonight, the subject of our FBI file, Homicide. Its title, The Sightseeing Killer. In the solution of crime, the Federal Bureau of Investigation makes use of every modern scientific aid. Microscopes, spectrographs, chemical analyses, and laboratory tests of infinite variety are part of the daily FBI routine. But no instrument has or will be invented which can replace human intelligence and dogged determination. The constant alertness and proven skills of the special agent himself are the true basis for all investigations conducted by your FBI. Without him, science would be helpless. Together, they form the combination which brings the criminal to inevitable justice. The case you are about to hear is an example of these two forces acting in conjunction to ensure the arrest of a killer within a few hours of his crime. Tonight's FBI file opens at a small eastern resort lodge. In the sitting room, the owners of the inn, two elderly gray-haired women are placing white sheets over the stiff Victorian furniture which lines the walls. Oh, be quiet, Jenny. Quiet, quiet. You'll have to cover her up, Cora Sue. Clara, she isn't bothering anyone. They've all checked out. Now, Jenny, you be a good bird. Come on, dear, come on. There, that's better. You're just lonesome, aren't you, poor Jenny? You you get used to having people around all summer, and then when the season ends, there's nobody to talk to. Jenny want a cracker? Well, of course she does. Of course, Sue, I'm waiting for you to help me with this sheet. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Tuck your end under the cushion. Yes, Yes, of course. Oh, dear. What's the matter, Clara? Oh, the upholstery is almost worn through. We'll have to get this sofa recovered next spring. Mm, and hardly seems worth it. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, we barely make a living out of the lodge as it is, and with that new motel opening up next year, well, we'll still it? have our regular customers. Mm. People who've been coming to stay here since before Father died. I guess so, but they're fewer every year. And I'll wrap these miniatures in tissue paper, and I'll pack them in this box. All right. Mm. Oh, it's cold tonight. Winter seems to come earlier every year. That's your imagination. Uh, I don't like it here when we're all alone. I wish we could close up now and stay overnight in Meadville. We'll leave tomorrow. Mm. For 20 years, this inn is closed on the 1st of October. And I see no reason to change that schedule because of some whim of yours. <gasps> oh! Cora Sue, that was Mother's favorite picture. I I couldn't help it, Clara. I saw something. What? At the window behind you. It looked like a face. Oh, stuff and nonsense. There's no one out there. Will you be quiet, Jenny? Now get hold of yourself, Cora Sue. See if you can find the broom and clean up this mess. (gasps) 
Now, you see, you've got me upset, too. Don't answer it, Clara. Don't let anyone in. We aren't in a position to turn down customers, Cora Sue. Every three dollars helps. Good evening. Can I help you? I hope so. I need a place to stay tonight. Please come in. I'm sure we can take care of you. Thank you. You'll have to forgive the way things look. We close up tomorrow. Oh? Well, that's a shame. I... I was hoping I could stay on for a few days. Well, I'm sorry, but we always close on the 1st of October. Well, I guess I'm lucky to get in at all, even for one night. Oh, hello. This is my sister, Mr... Johnson. Uh, Sam Johnson. How do you do, Mr. Johnson? My name is Clara Dalton, and my sister is Cora Sue Dalton. Pleased to meet you both. Uh, how do you do? Is there something wrong with me? No, no. You were giving me such a strange look, I was beginning to wonder. Don't pay any attention to Cora Sue, Mr. Johnson. She's been carrying on all evening. Just a few minutes ago, she thought she saw a face at the window. Clara. Oh, she saw a face all right. It was mine. What? I took a chance you'd have a vacancy and put my car in the garage. Then I happened to glance in the window as I came up the path. I'm sorry if I frightened you, Miss Dalton. You see, Cora Sue, I, I told you you were fretting about nothing. Well, who is this? Another member of the family? That's Cora Sue's parrot. Her name is Jenny. Mm-hmm. Hello, Jenny. How's the girl? Oh, I hope she didn't bite you, Mr. Johnson. Oh, she just took a nip. It's my own fault for putting my finger in the cage. I told you to cover that bird, Cora Sue. Ye- yes, Clara. Come on, Jenny. That's a good girl. Now, Mr. Johnson, you just sit over there by the fire and warm up. I'll uncover a chair. Well, I left my suitcase in the car. I'd better bring it in before I settle down for the night. Oh, you can go out that side door across the porch. Oh, thanks. Be right back. Seems like a nice young man. Do you think so? Of course I do, don't you? Well, he acts sort of shifty to me. Now, why on earth do you say that? I don't know exactly. But Jenny didn't like him either. She doesn't usually nip people. She's very friendly toward... Oh, boy. Boy, you know, that wind's darn cold. Oh, there's some coffee left over from supper. I could heat up a cup if you'd like, Mr. Johnson. Well, that's very thoughtful of you. As a matter of fact, I didn't get a chance to stop for dinner tonight. If you could fix up a sandwich, too, I'd be glad to pay for it. Why didn't you say you were hungry? I don't like to be a bother. It's no bother at all. Cora Sue, would you go out and get him that sandwich I made for you earlier? The one you didn't eat. Clara, I would If like... you please, Cora Sue. No. You don't live around here, Mr. Johnson? No, I drove up from Pennsylvania. Oh, did you stop at that cave on the way? Cave? Yes, Echo Cave. It's just down the road. You must have passed it. Well, I think I did see a sign, but I didn't turn off. It was so late. Oh, that's too bad. It's really quite a remarkable phenomenon. Well, maybe I can find time for it on my way back. Well, there you are. You can use this end table to eat on, Mr. Johnson. Ah, yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, I'll turn down your bed and take your suitcase upstairs. No, leave it here. I'll take it up myself. Oh, Just but is it... leave it where it is. Whatever you say... Hmm. Yeah, this is good, Miss Dalton. Down the road at Echo Cave National Monument, Park Service Ranger Evans leads Special Agent Jim Taylor along a blood-stained trail which winds into a clump of bushes. How'd you happen to stumble onto this, Evans? I was making a routine patrol about an hour ago, saw some blood up there near the road and tracked it down. I'm glad you called the FBI field office right away. Now, this being a national park, I knew it came under your jurisdiction. Jeff Hoffman was liked by everybody. You know him? Just to speak to. Worked at the souvenir counter over by the cave entrance. Mm-hmm. Well, here's the body, Mr. Taylor. Yeah, it's not very pretty, is it? No. Looks like it was robbery as well as murder. Mm-hmm. I wonder, uh, Hoffman carry much money? Probably the day's receipts from the souvenir stand. It's pretty late in the season. Wouldn't amount to more than 30 or 40 dollars. Yeah, killings for less than that. Hey, there's something over there behind that bush. Hmm? Man's cop. Oh? 
I may have some fingerprints on the shiny visor. It has a name band here on the inside. G. Collin. Well, let's get back up to the road, huh? I'd like you to help me make some plastic casts of the tire tracks up there. I must say, Mr. Johnson certainly was hungry. Oh, don't just stand there, Cora Sue. Mm -hmm. Dry the plate and put it in the cupboard. Oh, oh yes, yes. What are you daydreaming about now? Nothing, really. I I was just wondering what he has in that suitcase that's so important. The same thing most folks have in suitcases, I imagine. Clothes. Then why did he get so upset when I started to take it upstairs? It probably was too heavy. It wasn't heavy at all, Clara. (gasps) Oh, What, What are you so jumpy about? The phone startled me. But it isn't our ring. I know, but it still startles me. Now, don't you go out there and listen in. I've told you time and time again, the Logans don't like it. Maybe somebody's sick or something. I only want to find out if the call is important. Hmm. That's funny. Well, as long as you're going to eavesdrop, you might as well tell me what they were saying. But I only heard a couple of words, and then the phone went dead. Like it was out of order. Mrs. Logan probably heard you come on the line and hung up. No, no, she was right in the middle of a sentence when it happened. Oh, here, let me try it. All right. Hello? Hello? Operator? Operator? There's something wrong with it, all right. Must be the storm. They're supposed to disconnect it tomorrow anyway, so it doesn't make any difference. What was that? Now, Cora, I've put up with all the nonsense from you tonight that I... Shh, shh, shh. He's out and back again. I can hear him. He's upstairs asleep. You saw how tired he was. There. You heard him too, didn't you? Well, it did sound like somebody closing the barn door. But... The way you've been acting up, it's a wonder I'm not seeing things instead of just hearing them. Maybe that's why the phone went dead. Maybe he did something to it. Bosh! Where are you going? Upstairs. I want to see what's in that suitcase. Cora Sue, I won't stand for this. Do you hear me, Cora Sue? He's a perfectly respectable young man. Is he? He isn't in there. Well, let's see now. Oh, there's the suitcase over by the bed. If he comes up and catches you... Oh, I don't think it's even locked. No, it isn't. Well? There's a jacket and a shirt and a souvenir from Echo Cave. That's strange. He said he didn't stop there. Oh, there's something else. It feels like metal. It... Clara, it's a gun. (gasps) It... It looks like it's covered with blood. That's right, Oh, no. (gasps) You'll pick it up, please, and give it to me. Oh, yes, of course. Stay where you are. It isn't loaded, Miss Dalton. Don't come any closer. I told you to give me that gun. There. Now, that's better. Now, both of you better do exactly what I say. I don't like to frighten you, but even though this pistol is empty, I used it to kill a man. And if necessary, I'll use it again. Return in just a moment to tonight's dramatic case from the official files of your FBI. Did you ever see older people completely dependent on their children? Well, that can happen to anybody who doesn't prepare for retirement. If that is one of your worries, then perhaps the experience of Mr. Abner Willard may be helpful. Mr. Willard, 
I wonder if you'd mind telling us how membership in the Equitable Society solved your problem. Well, I'm only 39 years old, and I make a comfortable living. But the way prices are today, I can't lay an awful lot by. So my wife and I started to talk about where we'd be when we're in our 60s. Did you solve your problem? Our local Equitable representative did. You see, I heard you talking about a retirement plan on this program. That would be the Equitable Independent 60s plan. That's right. I called our Equitable man, and we talked it over. He explained how the Independent 60s plan would provide for our future, how we could go and come as we pleased and live where we wanted, because we'd draw a handsome check every week. And he also showed me how my wife would get all these good things if something happened to me. What surprised me most was how little it cost. Now, whenever somebody tells me he's worried about the future, well, I tell him to call up my friend, the Equitable Society Man. You couldn't give sounder advice. If you want to be independent at 60, if you want to own your own home free and clear, if you want protection for your wife and children, or assurance your children will get a college education, then talk it over with your local Equitable representative. You can count on him to arrange the most for your life insurance dollar. The solution to your life insurance problems is no farther away than your phone. To get his advice without obligation, consult your local phone book for the name of your local representative of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Sightseeing Killer. In the apprehension of a killer, time is a paramount consideration. Any delay may give the criminal an opportunity to kill again. Your FBI is always ready to move at top speed to bring the guilty to justice. But a mistaken arrest would only delay the final solution of the crime. The Federal Bureau of Investigation never acts unless and until it is satisfied that the right person has been found and that the evidence against him is overwhelming. Statistics show that convictions in FBI cases brought to trial average well over 95%. Both swift action and cautious investigation are the factors which have produced this remarkable record. Tonight's file continues a few hours later at the Meadville FBI field office. Special Agent William Bates has just entered the office where Agent Taylor is working. Jim, Supervisor Davis assigned me to work with you on the Hoffman case. Oh, I'm afraid I can use some help, Bill. I've gone over your report. Anything new turn up? No, not much. We got a description of Hoffman's car, and I sent out a five states alarm, but there's nothing on the killer so far. How about fingerprints? Well, there were a couple of sets on the visor of a cap that I found in the body. We've checked them against the dead man's, but they don't match. I sent them and the plaster cast of the tire tracks on to Washington on the 11 o'clock plane. Uh, I'll be hearing something soon. Oh, the uh, coroner's report came in. Here, if you'd like to look at it. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Time of death, about 6 p.m. Blunt instrument. Probably the butt of a pistol. That's what's got me confused. Why didn't he shoot if he has a gun? Yeah. Uh, wait a minute. Hmm? Maybe I got the answer for you. No? A report came in from Chief Watson here in Meadville this afternoon. I checked through to see if our office had any jurisdiction. And? We didn't, at least not on the face of it. But it may tie in... Filling station on Davis Street was held up about 4 p.m. The man forced the attendant into the washroom. The attendant jumped him, but the man didn't fire, just ran off. Apparently his gun wasn't loaded. Did you get a description? Not much detail. Medium height, medium build, brown suit, and a cap with a shiny visor. That fits. The cap I found fits that description. I think you've got something, Bill. Now, isn't Davis Street where the tourist buses leave for Echo Cave? For sure. All he had to do was lose himself in the crowd, get on a bus, and ride out there. Probably didn't want to take a chance on coming back through Meadville, so he stuck around until Hoffman drove by, got rid of him, and stole his car. Yeah? But Jim, yes. uh, this just came in on teletype. It's a report on those fingerprints you sent down to Washington tonight. Oh, fine. Thanks very much. Um, uh, here we go, Bill. Listen. Uh, Gerald Collins, 34, 5 feet 8, 162 pounds, black hair... Convicted assault with deadly weapons. Served five years, wanted in California for burglary and violation of parole. Sounds like our man. I'll send out an alarm. Bill, if he wanted to avoid Meadville, he must have headed south. Not too far, though. He's smart enough to know that car's red hot by now. Yes, he's probably holed up in one of the motels or tourist camps right in the neighborhood. Yeah, it's a good chance anyway. Let's check them. Put 
Where do you think you're going, Miss Dalton? Why, I, um... Uh, I wanted a drink of water. I'm sure you're not really very thirsty. Aren't you ever going to let us get some sleep? It's nearly two o'clock. You'll be able to sleep in the car. What are you talking about? We'll be leaving when the highway traffic quiets down. But you don't intend to take us with you. Well, I can't very well let you stay behind, can I? Well, that's... That's kidnapping. I know. Oh, by the way, we'll have to go in your car. I don't think it would be wise to continue on in the one I've been using. Oh, Clara. Don't make any noise. Whoever it is has seen the light. He knows there's somebody here. I'll answer it myself. Don't either of you move. Yes? I hate to bother you this late, but I ran out of gas about a mile down the road. I wonder if I could use your phone. I'm very sorry. The lodge is closed for the season. The phone's been disconnected. Oh. Well, then maybe you could let me have a little gas if you can spare it. I'm afraid not. There isn't even a car here. We're completely shut down. Oh, I see. Well, thanks anyway. I guess I'll have to hoof it down to the next station. Wish I could have been of more help. Good night. Good night. Well, I think we can start getting underway now. I'll bring down my suitcase. You'd better put on your things. Clara, what are we going to do? I, I don't know. Whatever he says, I guess. I'll, I'll get our coats out of the... What's the matter? I just remembered the hall closet. That's where Papa always kept his pistol. It must still be there. I saw it when we were doing our spring house cleaning. But, Clara, you couldn't fire a gun. You couldn't shoot a man. Maybe I could, Cora Sue. At least maybe I can frighten him off. He told us his pistol wasn't loaded. Now, where did I put Papa's gun? I, I thought it was on the top shelf, right behind this hat box. Is this what Clara? you were looking for, Miss Dalton? <gasps> well, where did I you... I thought you might have an overcoat I could wear, so I glanced through that closet while you were in the kitchen. You should never leave a loaded gun lying around. It can be very dangerous. Here's your Java. Oh, thanks. Hey, uh, waiter. Yeah? Where's the next tourist camp or motel, someplace we can get a bed for the night? We've been hunting all over. Everything seems to be filled up. You headed south? Yeah. Well, then I'd suggest Echo Cave Lodge. It's about a mile further on. A couple of nice old ladies run it. Uh, the Dalton sisters. They'll have lots of room. Fine, thanks very much. Bet. Say, I don't mean to interrupt, but you're giving them a bum steer there, waiter. Huh? Well, that lodge is closed up tight for the winter. I stopped there about a half an hour ago. Phone ain't even working. Oh, you must have been someplace else, mister. The Dalton sisters never closed before October 1st. It's been that way ever since I can remember. And October 1st ain't until tomorrow. Oh, I don't know nothing about no sisters. It was a fellow who talked to me. But it was Echo Cave Lodge. I saw the sign right out in front. There ain't no fellow there, unless he's a guest. You must have the wrong place. Excuse me, mister, what this man look like? Uh, I don't know. Kind of youngish, medium build. I didn't pay much attention. He was wearing a brown suit, it seems to me. Let's go, Bill. Uh, there's a sign, Jim. Echo Cave Lodge, a hundred yards ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I see the place now. Hey, look. There's a car pulling out from the lodge road. Yeah. Maybe Collins, two women with him. Yeah, I'll swing around. He's turning off toward the cave. Hang on. Looks like we lost him around that last curve. Well, he can't get very far. This road dead ends right at the cave entrance. There's a car. It stopped. Better take it easy, Bill. Watch yourself. Ladies are getting out. Guess they're all right. But I don't There see... he goes, running up into the cave. Come on. Know anything about this cave, Jim? Well, just that it's pretty big. This is the only entrance. 
Well, I'll see if I can raise him. Collins! Collins, we're special agents. FBI! Come out with your hands up! Got bullets this time. Yeah. Collins! Give yourself up! You'll never hit us in the dark! Give yourself up! Come out. Where are you? I can't see. We'll turn on a flashlight. I want to lay my flash on that rock. Get out of the way when I turn it on, Bill. Right. I think he hit him, Jim. Yeah. Come on, let's move in. Here he is, out cold. How bad's he hurt? His shoulder. Yeah. Okay, let's take him outside. Gerald Collins was found guilty of murder in federal court and was sentenced to death. In tonight's file, you heard another example of the cooperation and teamwork which enables your FBI to serve you. The report from a local chief of police furnished the killer's motivation. The quick action of a member of the National Park Ranger Service enabled the special agent to get an immediate start on the case. And the laboratory blood tests, plaster casts of tire tracks, and fingerprints in Washington made Collins' conviction a certainty. This is the kind of teamwork which no criminal can circumvent. And you are part of the same team. Your willingness to cooperate with local, state, and federal authorities is absolutely necessary for the prevention and discovery of crime. Remember, if these agencies are to serve you, you must help them do it. Worried about home ownership? Talk your worry over with your neighbor, your local equitable representative. He's a man who can help you solve almost any life insurance problem you may have. Perhaps you want protection for your wife and children against eventualities. Perhaps you'd like to find a way to enjoy life in comfort and independence when you're 60. Maybe you want to assure a college education for your youngsters. Well, call that friendly, helpful neighbor of yours. Consult your local telephone directory for the name of your local representative of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Its subject, Flight to Avoid Prosecution. Its title, Roundup. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of places or persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Frank Burt. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were B. Benaderet, Walter Catlett, Dal McKinnon, Helen Cleave, Steve Pendleton, Barney Phillips, and Carlton Young. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling transcribed story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Roundup on This Is Your FBI. Stay tuned for the adventures of Ozzie and Harriet. There's fun for the whole family when Ozzie and Harriet come your way next. This program came to you from Hollywood.